Okay, well, well we're, we're going to jump into this this uh, last session before the summary and next steps session, which is how do we as impact media organizations build commercial income without losing social impact? And we're going to hear from Oshin for The Better India, from Sarah Lomax Reese for Word Radio and URL Media. And we're also going to hear from David Floyd, who's doing really innovative work in London. So welcome to all three of you for this session. Tell us a little bit about Better India and how you've built up an incredible audience and incredible income stream too. So actually the Better India started, it's been there for like five, six years now. And of course, when it started as like a positive only platform, a lot of people questioned it, right? Because uh, media in general, is, is sort of, you know, um, sensational in nature, generally, yeah, especially in India. So, so the idea of it being a positive only news platform was definitely something that a lot of people opposed. And on the top of that, building a revenue stream out of it, right? Like content to monetize content in general is, is, is a difficult process, right? And how do you monetize a, an organization that's only focusing on impact news? So definitely it was it was difficult, but I think one of the things that we sort of, um, you know, stayed very clear with is that traditionally a lot of it was done through advertisements only, uh, editorials and advertisements. So of course, when we decided that because it's an impact um, organization, right? So advertisements can't just be like, you know, our only source. So we looked at a model wherein, you know, we could actually work with brands because a lot of brands and global organizations want to talk about their purpose, their shared values, you know, and, and a lot of uh, uh, communities in large are interested about knowing what brands really care about, right? So we thought that, okay, because we have built like a large leader base, you know, we have high engagement. So how can we bring brands on board and we can actually work on a purpose together, right? Wherein we give them the distribution um, uh, to our community and they give us like, you know, a cause that it, that they really care about. And then we work on that together um, to sort of dive deeper into it and sort of, you know, find solutions or like whatever they're looking at. And that sort of, you know, just like that was basically where we saw great uh, sort of, you know, um, feedback from brands that they were really interested in working with. And that's sort of, you know, our main monetization um, engine, if you if you put it that way, and of course, like um, uh, we are very clear on you know what kind of uh, content to actually work with, right? Because when you're talking about impact, we also want to ensure that whatever we do, the impact is like at the very core of it, right? So so it is it is something that's really warming up in India because everyone wants to be associated uh, with purpose and impact and causes. So yeah, we we it's 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 getting better. Here in India. The wonderful story about how Dimond and his wife Anuradha started the Better India over a cup of tea one Sunday because they were reading the, the newspapers in their kitchen and the, all the stories were so negative. How long ago was that? When did the Better India start? Remind me. So Better India oh. actually started as a passion project way back in 2008-2009. Just, you know, like four years they did it just out with their regular jobs and um, they actually formalized the company in 2013. Right, so, right. And give us a few statistics because they're so amazing about the audience. Yeah, so month on month uh, across our social channels on our website, um, we reach out to over 300 million readers. Um, and it's not just, you know, yeah, sorry. 300 million. 300 readers. million yeah. yeah, and that's only on the base of our English website. We definitely, you know, we launched uh, our regional languages uh, like Hindi and Gujarati, you know, other smaller languages that are spoken in India. And we are seeing like a constant uptick in, in adoption for that. Um, but yeah, like 300 million and, and that too. Um, so very recently we did a study uh, at the back of the data given out by CrowdTangle, which is Facebook's, uh, um, you know, uh, tool. And we were actually India's most engaged uh, media platform. Um, yeah, so so our engagement rate was, you know, much higher than all the traditional uh, news media. So uh, it, it, not just about our reach, but our engagement is also very high. How much can you guarantee independence from the work that you do with brands and the advertisers? What's, um, the, 
Oh, how about because because you know we know it's always a pull. It's a pull on our TV channel in the UK. It's always difficult, really, really difficult to stay independent from any kind of income. But, but how does that affect the Better India with the massive audience that you've got? The advertisers and the brands must love being associated with you. What are the dangers there? Uh, we are definitely very um, picky when it comes to working with brands, right? Like it's it's not like. Oh, um, you know, any any um, organization that wants to, you know, make it like a distribution game for them. It's it's not just, you know, plain and simple like that. Um, our sales cycles also, right? It's, it's more of a consultative approach rather than just like selling them, okay, you know, this is one template, we'll do one story for you and that's about it. No, we actually sit with them, um, sort of understand their values. We tell them our values, right? That this is what we're going to stay clear from. So we have said no to a lot of brands, a lot of people, a lot of brands that you know do not match our ideologies. So, so, and and then um, we sit together and work on 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 a campaign that both of us align with. It's not just you know they because they're giving us money. It's not like you know they can have their narrative. Can you tell us a little bit? Was there a tipping point when suddenly? suddenly it became financially viable. What was the sort of, what was, what was, what was the thing that, if you think about, you know, Nafisa's Muslim Mama's platform, they're trying to scale up. What, what was the Better India's tipping point? Like I said, right, like for four or five years, it was just done as a passion project, right? Like as, as the side gig. Um, and then the kind of feedback and the letters and, um, you know, sort of emotions that uh, Deemant and anu, uh, Anuradha received over emails, right? They saw that there was a huge traction, um, and and they definitely, I think, both Anu and Deemant were very clear from the start that they wanted to scale it as a sustainable business and not just as a not for profit. So definitely, the first sale. So they got into the whole revenue just at the back of their conviction that they really want to because both of them were engineers, MBA grads. So they knew that they could turn this around. But like the first sale actually wasn't easy. So like Deemant himself made the first sale. It took him like six, seven months to just close, you know, one client, which was Vodafone. So I think um, it, it, it took him a very long time. But I think after that, the kind of impact that other brands saw out of, you know, all the brands that we've worked with, some of those um, uh, campaigns get, you know, picked up by global publications. And then, you know, when other brands see that, so they, they sort of approach us. So it's, it's, I think, it's like a flywheel effect. Um, wherein they see good and they want to be a part of it. But yeah, like I think the tipping point was the kind of feedback that they were receiving in yeah. terms of meals. Mart yeah. Martin has a question for you. Martin, ask your question. Yeah, hi. Um, I'm just interested, Oshin, do you find that brands uh, come to you and mm -hmm. they're, they're sort of besieging you or do you have to go out and pitch to them? So it's both ways, actually. I won't just say that, oh, it's, it's definitely... we definitely do pitching but uh, right now to be very honest with you we just have a sales team of three members okay that's it so so we and mostly they are just busy with just looking at inbound queries that we receive so we on our website we have like uh, an advertise with us page um, and also a case studies page so when, on case studies we show all the things that we've done with different brands and advertise with us we actually show that you know this is the kind of reach we have these are the people who are reading us, you know, the basic demographics and stuff. And then at the bottom, we have an, uh, we have a type form, a small type form that, you know, if you want to get in touch with us, just reach out to us. So yeah, like we do have like a lot of queries coming in, um, you know, with for, for, for these kind of uh, brands that they want to work with. Second, we also uh, try to make sure that we are working with, you know, the same brands over and over year, like over uh, years. So like, you know, there's a big brand uh, in the automotive space called MG, MG Motors. So we are actually doing a campaign with them that's in the third year of its, its um, you know, running now. So it's, it's the third year we have um, three continuous years we work with them. So it's definitely both. And, and now as we plan to scale, we are uh, looking at getting more people in our team, sales team, who can actually do a lot more outbound um, you know, reach out to clients also. Uh, do you so, find that the um, you engage in quite a lot of consultancy with brands? I mean, do you go so far as to help them tell their stories 
uh, if they're consistent with with what you're trying to do with Better India, do you find yeah. that you help them tell their stories in a way that's going to be more impactful for them? So it's kind of a two way thing. You're also giving them consultancy as well as as well as space. Yeah, yeah, sure. So so like you know, like I said, uh, when they come on board, sometimes clients do have like a very clear narrative or or you know story or cause that they want to work with, right? So they tell us that okay, this is what we're looking at, and then we sort of come to a common term that okay, this is how we'll do it. We take care of their ideation to distribution. Sometimes yeah. the brands are not very sure. They say that oh, this is the space we want to work in, but we would love to hear your thoughts. You know how can we do it? So 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 then we sort of handhold them and walk them through the entire process. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Thank you, thank you, Oshin. That's really fantastic. Stay with us if you can. I know it's late in India. Um, really inspirational talk. And we're going to hear from Sarah now, who uh, I visited when I was in Philadelphia, who has an amazing story to tell as well. Can you stay with us, Oshin? Yeah, great. So, Sarah, welcome from Philadelphia. Hope it's yeah, a bit warmer you. there than it is in Chicago. And maybe, maybe a tiny, tiny bit warmer than Chicago, but it's cold here too. Um, thank you, Caroline, for um, inviting me. And I'm so um, inspired by Oshin's um, story uh, and, and, and uh, journey because um, the question of, you know, how do you make sust a sustainable business out of this kind of mission-driven work? Um, I guess I have a little bit of a different story because um, it's very, my experience is it's very, very difficult. It's a very difficult um, juggling slash balancing act to uh, authentically and honestly serve your audience, um, particularly when it's an audience that is not well loved by the corporate community or by the government or by uh, anyone, <laughs> really, you know, when you're serving people who have been traditionally marginalized, ignored, um, caricatured um, by both mainstream media and, uh, you know, American institutions, um, then it's very difficult to to um, uh, to to get them to to support your work in a full throttled way, and so I'm the the CEO and president of WURD Radio, which is a black talk radio station in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, in the U.S. And I'm also the co-founder of URL Media, which is a new company that uh, I started almost exactly a year ago with my co-founder, Mitra Khalida. And um, so I'll start with Word and then I'll, I'll go to URL if we have time. Um, but uh, my family owns WURD, we could say Word Radio. We, my family bought the station in 2002 and I've been running it since 2010. So Shane, when you said way back in 2008, I, I was laughing because, 2008 doesn't seem, you know, that that way back um, when you've been doing this work for, you know, since way back in the in the 90s. Um, but um, yeah, my family has had this radio station since 2002, and it was struggling. It was it was losing money, like bleeding red for years and years. And um, so the first thing that I would say in terms of how do you um, make a, a business, a viable business out of something that's mission driven. I think it really also relies on how do you start? You know, what is your business construct when you launch? And so um, if you launch with a lot of debt, it can be deadly, really, because what I've found in my experience is you need a pretty long runway to figure this out. Um, at least previously, you needed a pretty long runway. And when I when I was at this, and I've been a, a black media entrepreneur since my entire career, since the early '90s, um, and so you you need runway to figure out the model. 
And so if you are saddled with a lot of debt, that could be, that could be your undoing. It took us, I, you know, the station started in 2002. It was losing money, losing money, losing money. My family was getting ready to shut it down. Um, and I had published a magazine for 10 years, an African-American health magazine for 10 years prior to the, the radio station. And so I'm one of six kids and I would, all of my siblings worked in our family business, which was a healthcare business. And I was the only one who had media experience. Um, everybody else was like, a, a one was a lawyer, a CFO, all of these other things. But I, I had run this, this magazine for 10 years and understood content and distribution and advertising and just how a media organization works. And so when we bought the, the radio station, I, was, I had um, shut down my, my magazine because it was right after 9-11 and everything kind of fell out of the economy. And I couldn't continue running the, the, the magazine and struggling that uh, along those lines with the magazine um, for more, more years. Um, and so I kind of like sat in the timeout chairs, as, so to speak, and said, I'm not, I'm not going to be involved in media entrepreneurship for, you know, for the rest of my career, really, was my, was my, uh, my mantra to myself. And um, my family bought this station. It struggled, it struggled, it struggled. And... I started feeling like it was like um, professional malpractice for me to be sitting on the sidelines, not doing anything when I was the only one in my family who had media experience. And this, this station was very public. It was attached to my family's name and it was tanking. And so I was drawn in basically to make a long story short, I got involved. My family asked me to get involved and um, I started running the station in 2010. And um, we still were struggling, you know, honest to God, we struggled until 2020. Um, the reality is that after the racial justice protests in America, um, there was this, we, we say a racial reckoning and out of, you know, out of that, that protest movement, there was this you know, recognition that Black businesses, institutions, media had been starved, had been underfunded for centuries, you know, and oh, surprise, surprise. Um, but that really made a difference. And um, so we have, we are a for-profit company, but, um, and for, for many years, as some of you might real remember, is that um, philanthropic organizations would not donate to for-profit organizations. There was this, this real firewall, like if you're for-profit, forget it. We only fund nonprofits. Well, that's changed over, I would say the last maybe five years, that's really changed. And the fact that we are situated in Philadelphia, where we have a, a, a new, a relatively new philanthropic organization, the Lenfest Institute, um, for journalism, which really was one of the first funders for WURD. Um, I was on that board. And so um, I was able to make an impassioned plea that I was like a dog with a bone, that diversity is not just about diversifying mainstream newsrooms. Diversity is about supporting black and brown owned media. That is how you really empower um, authentic voices. And so um, I feel like that, that, um, that message started to, um, started to resonate. And I'm not, I'm not saying I was the only one saying it, I'm, there were other people saying it, but, but that, that message started to resonate. And we now see philanthropic journalism, philanthropic organizations really coming out and supporting community media and ethnic media and black owned media and those things as a part of the the whole kind of ecosystem and a way to empower um, uh, black and brown communities and I don't know if if Tracy Powell is still on the the call but she was one of the the first um, uh, uh, people funders who really got behind WURD in a strong, strong way um, when she was with Borealis. And that was like transformative because 
that was a grant that was for general operate. I mean, it was it was unrestricted. A lot of times these grants, you have to, you know, it's very specific what you have to um, what you have to spend the money on, but it they gave you all the money up front. They gave you the latitude to use it how you need it. And that was transformative. You know, corporate support has increased um, after the, the 2020 uh, racial justice protests. Government funding has increased through, but that's really as a consequence of COVID. Um, so anyway, but staying true to your audience, I guess that's my, my, my biggest message. If you are... And man, I'm telling you, it's hard. It's it's hard as hell, and and that's that's been my experience. It's hard to speak truth to power, to talk about racial justice, and to give um, people who have who are, you know, just not empowered, the power to tell their own stories in their own voice. That is something that um, is hard to monetize. It has been hard to monetize, but we have persevered and we have turned a corner and have, um, we had our strongest year in 2020. Um, 2021, you know, has been, you know, we, we were able to continue the momentum and we've grown and it's all been about serving our audiences. You know, we started an environmental justice initiative because, you know, black communities in Philadelphia and across the US are often situated in, you know, toxic, you know, uh, areas that are spewing pollution and there's lead and, and asbestos in our public schools and <clears throat> where black children are being educated. So we started this environmental justice initiative called EcoWord. We started an, uh, an uh, economic empowerment and wealth creation initiative called Livelihood, which is really devised to address the wealth gap the racial wealth gap by connecting um, black people to jobs, small business development resources, um, entrepreneurship opportunities, upskilling, all of those things. So recognizing like what are the gaps, what are the holes, what are the needs in your community and how can we as a media organization um, step into that space and provide real um, information and access and how do we hold the powerful accountable to the people. So um, those are, are some of the things. And then I'll just pivot quickly. I don't know how much time I have left, but um, to URL media. So URL stands for Uplift, Respect and Love. And it is um, a network of high performing black and brown owned media organizations from across the US with global aspirations. So right now we are a network of 10 media organizations. Um, we just added our 10th uh, at the end of 2021. It was our first indigenous publication, Native News Online, but our, 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 um, our 10 organizations cover the African-American community, um, the Latinx community, the um, South Asian, community, um, Native American and um, geography, the South uh, and uh, immigrant communities. So it's, it's a really wonderful mix of uh, race and ethnic groups, but also platforms. So we're radio, we're digital, we're WhatsApp, we're all different kinds of platforms. And the, um, the revenue model, and this goes for Word too, I would say this um, you know, you have to have diverse revenue streams. So for uh, Word, our revenue streams are um, advertising is probably the, the primary one. Um, grants, we have been successful in securing grants and uh, membership. For URL, it's grants, advertising and uh, recruitment. So that was kind of an unintended consequence. My partner Mitra, is very connected in the media world. And people were coming to her kind of informally about, you know, do you know anybody? Do you know people who, who we could um, hire? And um, she very thoughtfully and um, entrepreneurially said, wow, there's a business, there's a business um, opportunity here. And so URL now has developed this thriving um, recruitment and coaching 
um, B2B arm where we um, help mainstream media and then and now it's expanded to other organizations recruit diverse talent for um, their newsrooms and their their organizations and then also support those those um, uh, employees so that they can maximize their success within the organization. Quick question, what percentage of your income on Word now, and congratulations, by the way, on both organizations, amazing, amazing story. What percentage of your income is from commercial advertising, sponsorship, deals, oh. roughly, roughly, roughly? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Word, I would say, um, I would say it's about, it's about 90% advertising. Whoa, 90% yeah. commercial income. That's incredible. Well 90% done. commercial income. Yeah which yeah. is, you know, it's dangerous. It's, you know, and, and I, I, I don't want to sound like a broken record, but, um, you know, we, you have to diversify your revenue streams because when you are kind of an agitator, <laughs> when <you're, laughs> your role is about um, kind of, you know, and, and I think that's part of the journalism and media's role is to kind of um, hold people accountable. People can, can take their, you know, take their ball and go home. They can say, well, if you don't say, if you're not treating me the way I want to be treated, I'm going to punish you by not giving you any more advertising or not giving you any. So that's why as hard as membership is, we are very committed to a mem to building our membership revenue line at Word because that's where we can insulate the um, the possibility of people just um, you know saying that that we're not going to support you anymore and that could be devastating. Fantastic, that's really a great insight. Okay, so David, let's hear from you and how you're developing your commercial model in London. So I'm I'm David Floyd. I'm managing director at Social Spider CIC. We are a small uh, not-for-profit organisation based in Walthamstow in East London. And we uh, publish five local community newspapers in different parts of, of, of uh, different parts of London, and also work with uh, a range of organisations um, around the UK on, on doing similar activity. And uh, we launched our first newspaper um, eight years ago um, in uh, in 2014. Uh, in uh, in London Borough of Waltham Forest um, in response to the fact there wasn't an independent source of news in in the local area. Um, to clarify, there was, there was at that time a range of different sources of, of, of local printed news in, in that area. There are, there are a number of corporate newspapers with very little actual news content, uh, primarily advertising driven and no journalists based in the local area. They were journalists, you know, churning out small amounts of copy from call centres uh, many miles away. And also our, our local council at the time, uh, local authority published its own uh, newspaper, uh, publicising its own activities and uh, giving its own spiel on, on what, it's, what it was doing to, to local people. So we felt there was a, a quite a significant quite a significant gap in the market for for an independent uh, voice for local news but we we set about doing that with a social enterprise model which combines paid professional journalists who operate as our editors alongside volunteer contributions from people in the local community uh you know local residents or or people uh, working for, for community organizations and we uh we distribute copies uh of the papers for free across the local areas uh five local areas we're based in and we also have, have an online presence. Um, our, our income model is, as others have, have discussed, well, well, well the, 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 there's a range of similarities. The one similarity is, is very difficult. <laughs> that, that, and that's a recurring theme uh, to, to, make, to make local news work. But our income model is primarily advertising driven. So currently primarily print advertising driven with smaller amounts of, of online advertising and we also have a membership scheme where very local people pay to contribute towards uh keeping keeping the paper going i i, I suppose I, I, our starting point in terms of the overall business model i'm going to do five more specific points 
afterwards about the way we go about things. But it, I, 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 our starting point is that in the UK, corporate local news has been in a process of retrenchment. So, so corporate local newspapers have become steadily worse, scaling themselves yeah, down sure. to, to, to you know, areas which are profitable in terms of advertising, but make no sense in terms of actual news. So, so they're, they, you know, in, in most local yeah. areas, a corporate local newspaper still exists, but it doesn't, it doesn't publish any significant news content. Basically, the, 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 the flipping of the model from our point of view is that rather than looking at how much money a, new, a media organisation can make from a local area and what, what is the biggest level of profit which may be extracted from that local area by whatever means, our starting point is how do you maximise the resources available for local news in a given area and then spend them on producing the best possible local news publication. So that is, that is our approach. I mean, the, the kind of five five key challenges or processes that, that that we look at in terms of trying to do that you know not all of which we're always successful at all the time are i mean one keeping costs down you know you need to generate less income if you if you spend spend less money i mean it's it's it's, it's really difficult to do but but that is that is always useful to have as a starting point and where we're able to do it, it there's, there's, a, there's a real real benefit um from it the second one following on from that and kind of opposite and the thing you're balancing with it is not keeping costs down too much so obviously in, in the event you, you are paying people it is important to pay people fairly and it is important not to scrimp and save on on really really important things you know don't don't think that you can save money by getting your newspaper printed on the community centre's photocopier. You know, ultimately, that's that's going to cause you more problems than it than it than it solves if you if you try and make make false economies. So, 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 so that balance from you know don't don't spend unrealistically, don't don't you know, don't spend money on really expensive offices or flashy chairs or you know really expensive meals out, but but don't don't cut costs where they are very necessary. Um, third one is know what you're selling and why, and this is really a, a, a kind of key key challenge that that we you know we as a, a print led uh, business model are, are often facing in terms of you know being clear about who are the customers for whom that that advertising service is still relevant and useful because because there is a quite a strong residual market. But there's there's some people for whom that that market has disappeared. You know, there's no longer a market for selling classified ads for people who want to sell their bike in the local area. That stuff has gone. But what does still exist is if someone who is a, a locally focused estate agent or local school or college that wants to attract people to to come and uh, come and attend their their institution. These kind of advertisers, local print advertising, is still highly relevant to them. And also the, the fact, the, you know, the fact of supporting local news and supporting a high quality independent local news publication may itself be be a sales a sales factor to them. The 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 allied uh, point to knowing what you're selling is knowing who you're selling to. Uh, and, and and as I've said, that is who are the kind of businesses and institutions that really need to, to advertise in a, in a local publication and what are the benefits they get from that. And, and for us being, being clear on that and being clear about what our message is around that have been really, really important in terms of developing a sustainable model and enabling us to grow that. And then the fifth sort of broad point is getting the right people doing the right things. I mean, we started off as a very small not-for-profit organization getting one newspaper going we've, we've gradually built up and you know launched five at, at, at the point we got to more than one newspaper we had moved beyond the point where advertising could be sold by those of us who are primarily interested in the journalism side having a go and trying to do it as best we could you know we, we'd reached the point where advertising uh, and other commercial activities need to be carried out by people who Whose skills and focus was really on that. So, so moving to having a full-time advertising sales team initially with one person and, and now with, with three positions or three and a half positions currently, that's been vitally important in 
in developing a more more sustainable business model. I mean, it's not something that I'm sitting here saying we've cracked it. It's it, it, it's an ongoing process, you know, week to week, month to month of of making that model fit and work uh, on an ongoing basis. And it, it, it's a real challenge in local news, but it definitely is possible. And there definitely is a way of bringing together, you know, the need for local news, the public interest need for local news with communities desire to have, have that news available. Um, what, what percentage uh, income of your setup, which is you know, five newspapers and an aggregator platform as well, like Sarah's doing, um with the url word what percentage of your income is commercial in terms of the the ongoing newspaper publishing operations that is 85 to 90 percent um commercial income social spider as an organization does does other projects uh, alongside the publishing of newspapers and, and some of those are more likely to be grant funding we we're grant funded we, we, we get small amounts of grant funding for kind of additional work related to our newspapers as well but it's mainly 85 to 90 percent the, the advertising income and then around 10 percent of, of membership income which is the 300 or so local people who, who contribute on, a, on an ongoing basis to support the papers i didn't realize how how much your commercial income was that's really 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 great um, so questions to David, Sarah and Oshin. Is Oshin still with us? Yes. Hi, Oshin. I can see you now. Um, thank you, David, so much. It's really, it's really, really interesting. I, questions also about what, what, what Padma said about collaborative journalism. Obviously, Sarah has now set up URL Media, which if you haven't seen their site, is just amazing. And their newsletters are fantastic. So beautiful and so, so vital. And that's the whole thing. If you, I, I said right at the beginning of my introduction, but how can we all work together more? How can we create a movement? How can, and I'm very, very interested in this concept of aggregator platforms and partnerships and collaboration. Uh, so so um, questions from other people though. Sarah, what would be your ideal model of income? I mean, I just, I'm kind of quite envious of you. Well, at our TV channel, we have about, now we have about 90% of our income coming from advertising. And it's a relief in a way, because the thing of grants and donations and everything is exhausting. Right? Yeah, I mean, I think there's no easy way to make money. You know, like, like that, yeah. there's, there's a myth around, you know, the, there's a reason why they call it work. You know, it's hard, <laughs> you've gotta, you gotta put in the time. I, I mean, I, um, I I just wanted I wanted to kind of pivot to your earlier question about uh, networks because um, you know the reason that we started URL Media Network was because we recognize that it's very hard to make the economics and the impact that we want to make as local independently owned media organizations that are that are black and brown serving and and owned and led. Um, so the idea was, could we um, could we be more powerful? Could we be more impactful if we um, maintained our individuality and our individual audiences and our independence, but we shared content, we shared revenues, we shared um, amplification, we really supported each other. And, um, you know, we're only a year old, so the, the jury is still out, but we've gotten a lot of affirmation and um, there's there's momentum around this idea. And this year is really the, the year of the advertising and sponsorship, um, you know, model, really testing that out and figuring out how we share those revenues across uh, 10 plus media organizations so that it's meaningful. And, um, and so, but I, I do feel like um, if we can figure this, this, these models out, it could actually be a game changer for the journalism and media industry, um, both from an economic sustainability standpoint, but also from a competitive standpoint to be able to um, you know, because collectively over our 10 members, we have about an 8 million, you know, reach uh, in terms of audience. Um, 
individually, it's it's much harder to compete against you know the the big platforms or the big media organizations. But together, we um, we have a better shot, and I think it's a better model for the world. You know, like can we as black and brown people who really are predominant in the world, um, can we can we come up with alliances that are are um, mutually beneficial and really you know tap into this um, this this power that is music to my ears Sarah, Sarah really 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 exciting um, and I think we've got so much to look at in the UK about doing similar similar stuff whether it's focused on particular audiences communities or just our whole movement for impact media um, Oshin and David do you want to say sort of sum up the last thing and then we'll move on to the the next session in, in in a couple of minutes. It's been really inspiring to hear uh, Sarah and David uh, just you know talk about uh, how they have built um, you know uh, impact impactful and you know inspiring organization amidst all the chaos and um, constant learning and unlearning and relearning. So I think yeah, it's it's a very exciting space to be in. Of course, there are very many challenges that are there to be dealt with. But yeah, I think uh, we, we do have like a lot of book generation coming in now who's actually, um, you know, looking out for, you know, different diverse sort of opinions and narratives. So yeah, I think uh, it, it's, it's very exciting to be around. Do you think there's potential, you three, do you think there's potential for global partnerships, global aggregators? we'd love to uh, explore and you know just like because again right like a story the, the beauty of a story and storytelling and narratives is that you know it's not really bound by you know any any sort of geographical um, uh, any sort of construct that way right so 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 as far as like you know the stories can travel far and wide and more people can come on board to support that that initiative or that cause i think the more people support that the better it is so um yeah i think uh, looking forward to anything you know uh, that you know we could sort of potentially work together on in the future yeah great and sarah yeah well i was just going to say url definitely we we started url with the goal of eventually being global um, and so it's not, you know, it's never been just a U.S. play. It's really looking at, you know, the this world is so dynamic and diverse, and uh, there are wonderful players in every part um, of, of the world that are doing really important um, culturally specific work. And so, you know, we 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 want a, a worldwide um, network with URL. David, did you want to add any? big visionary stuff on on that last note. I don't know if we want to add anything big and visionary, but I I, I think just to say the, the perspective, I suppose, is slightly different for, for us as, as, as a local news publisher. But I, 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 but I, I would agree that we're, we're in a really exciting position in terms of what the possibilities are for new forms of media and, and more plural forms of media. And I, and I think there's a great scope for some of us who are doing this work at a local level in the UK to look at the the range of really positive examples that there are available globally and to see what we can we can take from those examples you know some of which you've highlighted in your research to to build you know sustainable and impactful models uh, at a local level here so really excited about being part of that